something. So we will start with the, the top voted question. And remember to go submit your questions and your votes. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question. So if anyone, if anyone disagrees with the default answer, the question is, would you like Amazon Web Service APIs as GraphQ, GraphQL APIs? If so, why? And my interpretation, you can tell me if I'm wrong, is would you like to have a GraphQL interface to all of the AWS APIs for managing infrastructure? Was that the correct interpretation? OK. So do any of you not want that? <laughs> I think the people from Google wouldn't want it. You know, uh, I work for Microsoft, uh, and we have Azure, so I don't want AWS to do that because it will improve it. So we could build a good UI for them. You could build a good UI. No, that's not possible. Shots, shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> Anyone from Amazon here? Any any further thoughts on this? Why? Why do you want this? I'll actually use AWS. <laughs> Um, I'm not as familiar with the AWS APIs. Most of the, um, the experience I have is mostly just uh, like custom hardware, GitHub, for example. But it sounds fantastic. As someone who's used like DigitalOcean for, for personal projects, that would be huge to be able to just do everything in one fell swoop. Uh, it would be mutation heavy for me, I think. I think I was talking to the people who asked this question in the hall earlier. And there's a lot of diversity in the AWS API, so it'd be nice to have a fairly normalized and self-documenting interface. I'd love that. Yeah, that is an understatement. There is a lot of diversity in the AWS APIs. OK, make that one. Oh, it disappeared. Great. See, it's magic. It's working. It's working, Gerard. Uh, how do you handle the validation errors on mutations? What is the response shape you return? So this is not well specified, I think, in the GraphQL spec. And the reason for that is I, and I think Lee would probably agree with me, don't like what we did at Facebook. And we were looking at it, it's like, well, we could specify the thing that we don't like and make everyone use that for all of time. Or we could underspecify it and hope that the community comes up with something better than what we have and then we can adopt that. So I think that you know, we actually only return one error. It has like a random error code. We actually completely stole it from our graph API. Uh, and I hope that there are better answers from people in the community, people in the audience, and people on the panel. Ours is a big hot mess. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not great. We do consistently return 200s, I think. Um, the Well, when we can. Um, the, the tricky part is that in some cases we're building for ourselves and in other cases we're building for external users. And for external users, the idea is that, well, we know that you need to get something just to like hydrate the view. Um, but in other cases, like uh, I've come across some endpoints or some mutations that just return true. And it's just like, oh, man. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, because of the lack of specification, we, we have stuff all over the place. Part of what we do is we have a user errors hash that comes down, and if we understand early on that based on like input requirements that all the data isn't there or that it's invalid for some reason that the IDL kind of describes, we'll tell you why, um, and we'll tell you where in your query the error was made. But similarly, if it's invalid for business logic reasons, the app just kind of shits itself. <laughs> I think we're experimenting there a little bit in our um, application. I mean, we're basically the the youngest ones, I guess, to the block here. Um, we've, we've just started three months ago. And um, what we definitely can see, I think, out of the discussion with our front end people, that, that errors is sort of the still wacky topic in, in GraphQL. Um, what we try, for instance, is um, whenever we can send status codes, we do. Like, for instance, if the query isn't even executed, um, then basically we return 400 status codes for those kind of things. Um, we also standardized around error messages in general. So even if the query is not executed, you get basically back the data equals nil and an errors portion in there. Um, we also have something in there basically like, like tagged errors. So it turns out I mean, the, the, the error messages in, in GraphQL for us are pretty, pretty neat actually to, to, as a human to see. But in order to make some sense programmatically out of them, they are actually pretty hard to work off with. So um, we have sort of like, like an additional error ID thing in them, which just says, OK, query could not be parsed, for, for example. Um, 
for the mutation part, what we do is, um, I think, a little bit specific to our specific scenario. We're building a proxy on top of REST APIs. Um, and we're, we have just in the errors a special reserved details area where we just you know, move the, the error response from the internal API to, to the front. And on top of that, just do a little bit of case conversion. Because internally, we have a lot of Rails applications who use the nasty snake case. Um, no front-end person actually likes that, right? Um, so we convert that on the fly. I'm going to take away as a best practice. The app just kind of shits itself. I like that one. <laughs> Where is the operator of this application? Because it looks like we have the two questions we already asked here. So I saw another one. What color is the sky? No. It's not sorting properly, is it? Um, <clears throat> There was one that said GraphQL creators, if you could go back in time and change something, what would it be? And we only have one GraphQL creator here. However, I would also ask those on the panel if you could make them change something and go back in time. Yeah, I, I want to hear what everyone else has. I feel like that's going to be way more interesting. Like, what do we screw up? Caching conventions. What's that? <laughs> Caching conventions. Like, you, like you, would, you would want something equivalent to like the node ID and the global IDs to actually be in the spec itself as opposed to sort of being a best practice? Or not so much that, it's like things like e-tags or um, how long can you expect a field to be valid for, like TTLs on fields, anything like that. We could build it in ourselves, but it would be nice if there was something a little more high level. Uh, I don't have a ton to contribute. I think actually that last issue of um, more standard around how mutations should be returned is, is something that has been the most confusing for application engineers and ourselves as platform engineers building GraphQL. Um, just having more structure of the things that you should always expect this response or starting from this particular point has been ambiguous for us. Um, maybe not something that should be changed, but something that just gives me a weird feeling in my stomach, looking forward to potentially, I don't know, in our case, 200 developers using and expanding the schema. Um, namespacing, actually. Mm. Right? I mean, I, I know that it's debatable, and, 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 and um, you, you're having a lot of discussion in that regard, but I can see already, you know, conflicts around naming lurking in the sky when I have, I mean, so many people concurrently working on the schema. What do you think about that? Um, I think I'd, like all three of those strike me as like the good news because I wasn't sure what to expect. They all seem like things that we can potentially fix, which like makes me really happy that we're in a place where, you know, if, the, if we end up with something that the community really likes and we find that there's a ton of adoption, it's the type of thing that, you know, we're, we're not completely caught and never going to be able to recover from it. So that that actually I, re I really like those answers. Right. So there's sort of an implication of go back in time that you screwed up and everyone's <laughs> screwed now, right? And all of those are things yeah. you can do in the future. So there's nothing you screwed up that was just like a language level oh, mistake. I'm, I'm sure there's stuff that we screwed up that was language. Does anyone have one? No, you wouldn't be here, I guess. I, I was That's trying. To, I, I saw this question in advance. And I was trying to prep. Uh, the one that bugs me the most actually is uh, not in GraphQL itself, but in the connection convention that we have. Uh, has next page and has previous page, has this weird behavior where like you're paginating forward and has previous page is like kind of meaningless. And I remember it was like a year in, we talked about changing that and it was like, uh, that seems like it's gonna be too much work. And I, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I should have fixed it. So, because has previous, you're like paginating forward and like what does has previous page mean if you're in a, if you have a back end that like starts from that cursor, does it actually know? Just bothers me every time. <laughs> Just sorry, building on that one point, uh, you'll notice if you're ever looking at a page on GitHub that only has next and no previous, that's why. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> I was just going to say one of my most favorite unexpected things is that in connections, nodes don't actually have to implement the node interface. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one's on me. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Have you, have you ever seen the, or read or watched the Guy Steele talk called Growing a Language from Upsilon 98? No. Anyone? Everybody should either watch or read that. Anyway, the nice thing is, one of the things he talks about is building up from primitives, and it's all about not putting too much in if you want to allow your language to evolve. And I think pretty much everything that you heard just now was stuff that you didn't do yet, which, at least by Guy Steele, who is an expert language creator, is a good, good move, so good job. Growing a language. How do you handle partial query failures? 
in a microservices world? Uh, I can start off. Um, we have a few services behind the Majestic monolith. Um, in some cases, we even have separate databases. They're just uh, the same sort of idea, same sort of active record models, but they're hitting a separate database. And in those cases, I believe what it says in the spec is to go up to the next non-nullable uh, or nullable response. Um, and that's generally what we do. And we'll populate the errors hash with, sorry, this particular part of the query could not be executed at this time. Try again later or something like that. Um, Yeah, I think it becomes a modeling exercise because um, I think the benefit of it is now that you have this type schema is that you're actually forced to think about whether this is nullable or, or not. And um, usually we, what we just do, the, the things um, that can fail are nullable. And um, most of the time uh, the UI is able to render somehow in those cases. Right? Um, when it's not supposed to do that, then just define it as non-nullable and the thing will bubble up. We just don't use non-nullable. If it's a field, it's nullable. And the, the issue that we run into is exactly the case of like, you say it's non-nullable, which means you will always, on the server, always be able to provide me a value. And then it's a resolver function that, I don't know, could throw an exception or could do an async call or could honestly do whatever it wants. Even if you have a language where it's like, I can guarantee this never explicitly returns null, you don't actually know what that function is doing. Uh, so non-nullable didn't even exist until we were formalizing the spec and we thought this, this would be valuable. Uh, it is still to this day not used in Facebook schema. Like you, you look at our IDL, no exclamation points. So you shouldn't have put that in the language. I, I don't know. I, I, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think it does have value. I can see, you know, especially as I've been using like the generated flow types, and it's like has next page is a nullable boolean. I was like. Oh, but that one we actually do know. Uh, so, that, so there are cases where I could imagine using it, but I definitely, when, I, when I'm thinking about schema design, I'm always like, start assuming that something could go wrong and it's nullable, and then be like, I am absolutely certain either this will always return a real value, or if it doesn't return a real value, the object is completely useless anyway. I think ID is a field that could very often be non-nullable, and that, like, I don't know, your get ID function on an object should not be doing a ton of work because you probably already fetched it by ID. But like even, honestly, like name on a user, I might still make nullable. Like there's crazy stuff that can happen there. All right, I like this one because it sounds hostile. Don't server stored queries defeat the core purposes of GraphQL? This is a take on restish from what we heard earlier where you're building like client-focused APIs. Um, I think this is one of the coolest and most powerful parts of GraphQL that you're truly letting your users build like entire endpoints in some cases where you just pass the stored server ID and you get back anything that you can dream of. From our perspective at, at GitHub, this is in incredibly powerful because um, we can do analysis on those persisted queries on the server, which is hugely valuable for us of like, okay, 10% of the population is always asking for this field. We know that we can go back and optimize that as opposed to doing it in a more ad hoc way of, oh, okay, looking back at the exact history of how that worked, um, how did this perform? Um, at Shopify, we haven't, we really want to implement these. We're not quite there yet. But what we found really early on is that like as our schema grows, the queries get larger and larger. And eventually like we're building apps internally that run off our API. Their requests aren't variant in any way. They're always the same. So why are we sending this gigantic payload to the server to receive it back? And there's really no need to do that if you can just persist the query and then run with it between versions. The, the story around persistent queries almost, I think, reveals how it came from a traditional, you know, traditional GraphQL, send the query up, get the response back, and then we had the same realization, which is like, why are we uploading this giant blob that's the same every time? And so you'd send it up, and you'd get the re response back, and in just like a random header in the HTTP response, it was like, X GraphQL persisted ID, and it's like, by the way, if next time you're going to send this exact string up again, you can send this ID instead, and it'll save time. And I think when you think about it in that way, where it's like, oh, you just like gave me a shortcut for issuing the query, it feels much more natural, and then it's somewhere like, wait, we don't even need to send it once from the client. We can actually have build time, persist it, and just use the persist ID. And that, that's where it sort of gets weird, where it's like the client isn't really controlling the query. They like said what query they wanted to use and persist in an endpoint. But I think as you, with the evolution, I can sort of see how we arrived at that without like really violating any of the principles.
Uh, just to add to that, I think that this kind of uh, dives into the two stages of like development. One, or well, of production. One is development, where you're trying to figure out what the right GraphQL query is, and it may modify and change very quickly. And then once you've actually deployed it, generally speaking, the query will stay the same until the next big deployment. Um, so in that case, you can optimize for the least amount of uploads uh, or posts. I think two additions in to that. Um, um, once you um, talk to security people, you figure out, um, I mean, when the, the first moment they hear about GraphQL, they get very nervous, <laughs> right? Like, like arbitrary <coughs> queries on the platform. It's like, OK, how can we prevent that somehow? And the, the persistent queries actually make the discussion much, much more easier, because you, you, you have a good trade-off between security on one hand and also, I mean, flexibility in terms of uh, development speed and evolvability of the APIs in, in general. That's, I think, great. Um, we plan it also to have it at some point. Um, the other thing, what a what little bit plays into it is, like, um, I think, um, if we take, for instance, Sangria as an example, it already has this, this notion of um, complexity you can specify in there. And this is a great teaching tool, because you all, all also want to take new developers by the hand and, and give them early feedback to tell them, okay, maybe you shouldn't do that query at all. right? Split it up somehow. This is highly inefficient. Um, and the earlier you do that, the better. You don't want to find that out somewhat in production. Right? So that's that's another thing of you know offloading this this analysis to an, to an earlier state. I think a really good idea. All right, how is hypermedia as the engine of application state solved by using node IDs concretely? This was only touched briefly by Brooks, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that it absolutely does, but the idea of having. Um, relationships in your schema is something that we've always strived for in our REST API. Uh, I mean, hypermedia links are something that we added with uh, relative success. I mean, some people use it, but a lot of the time, people are manually reconstructing everything for their own representation. Um, the, the, the idea of um, us being able to uniquely identify uh, any object is really dependent on making sure that you can actually identify it in the absence of a query. So um, if, if you have any state on your side as an integrator, for example, if you can persist those IDs and then go back and fetch an, any sort of information that you want, that's hugely valuable. Um, but it, it takes that first initial understanding of the ID in order to get to it. And so it can really go either way in that regard. Anything else to add? Not from my side. All right, me either. Good job. <laughs> OK. Uh, when will we get defer and stream support, Dan? Uh, <laughs> Lee, stay tuned. Stay tuned. I, 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 are you, you're going you're gonna to at least talk about it in a bit, right? All right. Are you saying that this ruins his talk if you answer it now? I don't. I don't think it ruins his talk, and I also don't okay. want to hype it in that like this is going to be like a one more and, and one more thing like pull requests. But I think Lee, Lee is going to touch on sort of using directives to enhance things and like where where defer and stream might go. So. All right, then we're going to defer that question. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. What organizational changes do you it. see? It's really hard to read when it does that. Oh, hey, here we go. What's this tool we're using for Q and A built with? GraphQL and React. <laughs> Am I right? Do you want to say more? It's Firebase, I think, because it was Firebase app. He doesn't want to talk. What is it? You said it. He said it. GraphQL and React. And PHP. <laughs> Perl. Oh, Perl. Perl CGIs. Next. What organizational changes do you see in your org after migrating to GraphQL, for example, for front end and back end teams? Well, I can start. I mean, I think this is actually where, where the real magic is happening. Um, I mean, we're very, very early at this, but you can already see first first glimpses of it. And traditionally, we're seeing we, we're very much in this, you know, the, the iOS developers are here and the Android developers are here and the back end is here. And we tried to change that somehow organizationally in the last years. We now have, I mean, product product teams, which basically cater the product for all platforms. But it turns out they're still, you know, um, in a way, um, 
prisoner of their old mindset to a degree. I mean, they, they don't feel themselves as building a single product. And a funny thing happened when we, when we added um, GraphQL to the first um, well, pilot, actually. Um, people started talking a lot more to each other. And we, they tried to fiddle around with the schema, what it could possibly do for them. And it, it completely changed, in, in my mind, the, the, the culture around building um, a multi-platform multi product. That's, that's um, well, suspected, but not expected for us. And the, the, the speed completely took us by surprise. I mean, you, you go from, if I'm an iOS developer and I go to the Android village, it's like, how did you build that? And they send me an overly verbose Java file, and I'm like, never mind, I'll re-implement it, to they send me a graphical link, and I'm like, sweet, I'm, I'm in good shape. Uh, for us, we, like Shopify is a gigantic monolith and with that comes a gigantic API footprint and we used to do what I termed as uh, Wild West REST. Um, and there was no really great way to see changes in that API when people push changes out or if people ran a migration and it had side effects in the API. With GraphQL and just the IDL files that we can generate using the GraphQL Ruby gem, it creates a lot more visibility to our API changes, which gives us a lot more room to be very consistent and to have kind of domain experts on GraphQL take a look at it and review it throughout the company, which is something we've never really had before. And it's kind of made our API development go a lot more smoothly. Yeah, same here. Um, it, it has completely changed the way that we work as an engineering organization because it has propelled the idea of GitHub as a platform forward. So similarly to what I was speaking to earlier in my talk of because we're building things GraphQL first, that essentially means that everyone has access to the same platform. And um, as far as internal to GitHub goes, uh, that means that application engineers are writing schema. It's not just like um, my team, the GraphQL team, who's writing all of this schema because we just can't keep up with all of that. Um, so yeah, I mean like everyone is writing GraphQL schema now and everyone does that from the start and then you build your UIs on top of that. I mean, we're pushing the limits or well, we're pushing the definitions of true MVC and Rails because we're starting to push like these GraphQL queries into views and we're starting to divorce ourselves from the, the traditional uh, Rails st style. Um, and so with that comes a lot of documentation that we need to generate and tutorials of not just this is GraphQL, but this is GraphQL at GitHub as well. I think one thing that it brought, and we saw some of this with just the standardization of our data layer, sort of the layer below GraphQL on our server, uh, is mobility among teams, which is if you know, you're a developer in a non-GraphQL world who works on you know, iOS events and you want to go and work on Android groups, like what is the thing you have in common? You both hit the same top level domain if you're doing your API request and that's about it. And now it's like, oh, I know to issue the GraphQL request on iOS, it's the same API on Android. Let me replace events with groups in my top level query. Sweet, I'm, I'm up and running. And so I think it creates this ability to just almost this familiarity with all other parts of both the app and then even jumping across platform familiarity as well that allows a lot more mobility and therefore collaboration. Are, are you all familiar with Conway's law? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you know how? Um, maybe you could explain what Conway's law is because I always get it backwards, but I wonder if there are any, any ramification here in either direction. I, th I mean, my understanding of Conway's law is that the software that an organization develops, like the shape of the software, will, will always match the shape of the organization. Yeah, but some, sometimes the, or the technology shapes the organization, right? So it matches but isn't driven by? And, and I, th I think we've... Yeah, it, it sort of works in both dimensions in that I, I think you described that you're sort of starting to align based on products as opposed to on platforms. And we've done the same thing where, you know, we don't want to have an iOS team that has like groups and events and timeline and an Android team that has groups and events and timeline. We want to cut it in the other direction. The problem is if you're developing sort of a stack that has nothing in common, then like where do you need the most communication unless you have a really, really solid API boundary between almost the like various layers, you're much better cutting it by platform because like those are the people that really need to collaborate. And I think GraphQL and other APIs, some of that I actually think React and those technologies gave us the confidence where we no longer needed to have these platform aligned teams because we assumed that the way each individual layer communicated was standardized really across platforms. Do you think there's a downside of that eventually? Uh, you have to maintain that connection. And then I'm definitely seeing that where you have to, and like whichever way you cut it, if you cut it by platform, you need to make sure the product teams are communicating. If you cut it by product, you have to make sure that like 
the platform teams are communicating, and that just gets tricky. I think it requires work in either direction. Yeah, I find in organizational uh, structures that they tend to have to flow back and forth between technology alignment and business alignment or whatever you want to call it. I wonder if GraphQL forces you into one in a way that's unnatural ultimately. I hope not. We're about to run into that problem. <laughs> this but. is why in 10 years there's going to be a talk about how we <laughs> screwed ourselves with GraphQL. <laughs> All right. Uh, how do you model permissions in your GraphQL APIs? Do you have a flag for everything? For example, is allowed to, can use, can see, et cetera? And uh, again, we're going to put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, we're slowly changing the way that this works. We have um, like a, essentially like a can do uh, DSL in, throughout the GitHub code base. And what we've done is found ourselves where um, during query execution, like a query comes in, from a user and we want to actually hit the database at the end of the day, um, we're trying to do it at exactly the right point where based on the set of scopes that the token has been granted and based on who the viewer is, um, let that inform the underlying uh, SQL query or you know, Elasticsearch query, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, the short answer is we're actually tapping into the same sort of can logic that we had in our REST API. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't think that we'll keep it that way forever. Um, but yeah, I think being able to um, reuse that same sort of logic throughout your different connections and through certain nodes is also something that um, is very valuable. Um, because in some cases, we have duplicate connections that are just different a little bit, but they may not. Um, the underlying authorization or permissions behind them um, should probably stay the same. Um, so I guess my only word of wisdom is make sure that you reuse the logic so that nothing slips through. We've done a very similar thing. Like if anybody's worked with the Shopify API before, um, you can request OAuth scopes with your API client, and we just have like uh, DSLs that we've built on top of the GraphQL Ruby gem to specify what scopes are required for what resources. It's pretty simple. Uh, we have no permissions in our GraphQL layer. It's all in the layer below that. So we actually completely diverge, I think, from what you both described, where a given field has, n like, it just is like, cool, you called this, and you called this with a viewer, which is passed in this context. Sounds good, I'm gonna pass it down to the layer below. And that layer below, uh, we refer to it as ENT, which is short for entity. That is responsible for all of our, can you see this because of Facebook privacy? Uh, can you see this given your given uh, platform token? One nice thing, even though we don't have a public GraphQL API, it's, we still use it internally, that logic in the entity layer knows all about our platform policy. So if we did want to like build a public one, it should already be in place. So I actually think that's an interesting divergence from putting it in the GraphQL layer versus saying that's not the responsibility of the GraphQL layer, it should live at a layer below. How did, how did you, when you were, because presumably you had REST APIs before, how did you make sure you got it exactly right between like what the REST API permissions were and what the GraphQL permissions were? Uh, we use the exact same logic. <laughs> uh, we use the exact same tool. It's an internal tool. We call it egress. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you in that this probably is not a concern of GraphQL. And if you can push it down to a layer b below, that's perfect. Um, but just to get us up and running, we, I mean, we quite literally just took the same DSL that we were using and reused it inside of our resolvers. And then slowly we pulled it out of our resolvers and into these, method, or these classes that could be ah, reused in different places. We're pretty much not done with that. So, I mean, pretty much in um, in progress there. I mean, we try to follow the, the general pattern that, that we saw in other, other APIs, like can do, is, has, those kind of things. Um, and since we're, we have a proxy, basically, a lot of the stuff is already um, in terms of um, you know, business logic validation, those kind of things is happening in, at the service layer, not, not not in GraphQL itself, um, and it's likely that we keep it that way for, for that matter. It's already there, we just wrap it and make it available in a, in a very developer-friendly way. Um, yeah. Cool. So this is my question. I get to ask my own, amazingly. I put this in case no one could access the, the, the app. What has been the hardest challenge in adopting GraphQL in your team or product? It could be a technical thing or an organizational thing. And uh, I would probably not really care about Dan's answer yet. Aww. Well, you can jump in if there's something pressing. We're, um, as an engineering organization, Shopify 
is at this point fairly large. It didn't used to be. It's kind of doubled year on year, but we're approaching 600 developers. So the difficult thing with GraphQL for us has been evangelizing it properly. Like As we've been standardizing internally how we're going to use this technology, there's still work going on throughout the company building new APIs when all of the stuff we're working on isn't quite ready yet for them to build on. And I think we're over that hump where what we've been working on is ready to be used organizationally wide. Some people inside Shopify may have different opinions. But um, yeah, evangelizing it and getting the message out to all of the people and all of the different parts of the company has been the biggest challenge. Like it's not technical at all, it's just communication. Yeah, I can second that. Um, um, it's, it's actually a large part of what we're actually currently doing because the, the question is how, how do you deliver early value, right, so that people can use it and see the, the value for themselves rather than, you know, forcing that thing on them at some point in the future. I think having it Having it available so that people can use it is, is very important and very fast, and then just add in features on on, on the mid-run. Um, and we're doing sort of crazy things. I, mean, I haven't actually done before in, 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 in my engineering careers. Like, okay, we started internally blogging, for instance, and we're doing screencasts just to, to, to generate the awareness that this thing is coming, right, and that 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 this is how it feels, and this, this might... If how it affects you, that might be how it affects you in the future, and the general reception is pretty pretty interesting because it it it, it generates this um, this playfulness. I want I want to try that out as well. I mean, I, I give it to me. I, I I want it. I I want to have it now. Don't let me wait for it. Um, and this also changes a little bit the organizational dynamics around it. For us, I'd say we also have an evangel an evangelizing. Um, problem, but the story is different uh, internal to GitHub and external to GitHub. I think it's a little bit easier for someone who's used the API in the past to, you know, you, you hit all these REST APIs, you have to stitch all this data together, and, and if you see it in GraphQL and, and graphical better, you know, people just, it clicks. And our integrators are like, this sounds really cool and really exciting. The story internal, though, is, you know, we're, we're a bunch of Rails engineers, and so it's been harder to make that switch. And really, the underlying reason is because we want the same platform for everyone. Um, and so that's been hard, just trying to document the ways in which we use it, the reasons in why which we're using it, and things like that. So your problem is that Rails engineers are inflexible and incapable of understanding <laughs> new technologies. Say that, Brooks said that Rails engineers are inflexible. <laughs> Heard you say exactly. Um, does anybody use GraphQL for server-to-server -server communication? Yes. Yes. Does anyone disagree? <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> uh, we're using it for some of our first-party applications. Um, a lot of... Um, like you can, if you were to introspect our apps that we've released or use a man in the middle proxy, you could see where we're using GraphQL. Uh, we've been using it with some internal applications and going to server to server. It's still kind of new for us that way, but we're trying to build more in, using that convention. Why GraphQL over Thrift protocol buffers, Captain Proto, your favorite cloud of protocol buffers? Because we built out the platform in GraphQL. Fair enough. So, I mean, I think. We don't use it for server-to-server -server communication, but only because we already had our server server communication in Thrift, uh, and so it was one of those we could go and rewrite it to be in GraphQL, but it's working and it's fine. I don't think there's anything categorically wrong with it. It's just we don't do it because we already had something. That's actually, we've um, our server-to-server -server communication was always built on top of the same technology that we released to third parties. Mm. So we have the Shopify API gem, which wraps up all of our resources in REST. All of our apps that we develop against Shopify use the Shopify API gem. So it was really easy to just start switching things over because we're using the same technology internally as we may eventually be releasing externally there. I mean, um, we don't plan to do it, but it's not the first time actually that I hear the, the, the question from, from developers, from us um, especially. Um, now that we have this proxy on top of our platform, that's all nice, um, but actually why do we have to um, write internally REST APIs? Still? I mean, isn't there a better way if it's all so glory and shiny? I mean, why, why do we have to continue that? Um, and my reaction usually to that is, yeah, well, time, time will tell. I mean, I, I want to see it first, I mean, turning, turning the way we're building product on the, you know, edges of the platform um, really make 
may be a useful thing for, for our organization, and then we can talk about how we let it in deeper into the platform where it makes sense, of course. Right? Um. Any other thoughts? No? Okay. What is the biggest customer benefit for your API consumers offering a GraphQL API versus what you had before? They didn't have to do joins in FQL. Everyone was really happy with that. Um, having developed against our own APIs, I'd say uh, consistency is a huge benefit, especially around types, because that is something that we get confused internally when we change data or when we change little bits of code that have weird side effects. GraphQL has made things much more consistent for us, so we have a lot more guarantees with our APIs. Uh, for us, I, uh, I can only speak for myself as a consumer of the GitHub API, but I truly think that it's the number of round trips that it takes to get your data. Um, if we try and stay true to RESTful API design, there's so many different um, resources to get the data that you need. For example, if you're trying to get commit statuses for all given repositories, there's a crazy chain of hypermedia links that you have to follow to get the information that you want. Being able to just describe that in your query is a beautiful thing. That's actually a big thing for us, too. If anybody... Um has tried to pull down Shopify collections. You have to get the collection, which has all of the product IDs, and then you have to get all the products by those IDs, which is a large number of round trips, and GraphQL just makes that go away. The N squared or N cubed plus one problem. Yeah. Is there, or go ahead. I can sort of, one thing that, you know, these, we certainly got these benefits, but one downstream benefit that I don't know if we anticipated and that has really paid off is the ability to build client tooling around GraphQL, which is basically once you have a .GraphQL file and a schema, like you can build everything for your client developers, where it's like, you wrote this .GraphQL file, I'm going to generate models for you, I'm going to generate the code that hits the server for you, I will, like, I'm gonna generate the parser for you, like everything that you would want, you can effectively hand them an artifact that's like, you wrote this GraphQL query for me, here is a function you can call that takes in all of the inputs to that query and asynchronously returns to you a strongly typed model object that matches exactly what you got back. And that, like, that's one stage. And then once you have that primitive, you can start to build almost like abstractions on top of abstractions to the point where when I think of a view in the Facebook app, your list of friends, you can basically describe that with a .GraphQL file, a little bit of configuration, and a React or Litho or component view for the list item. And there's not really much else that the product developer needs to do. And it's hard for me to imagine how we could have taken all of that crazy complex, you know, scrolling, infinite scroll, pull to refresh, swipe to delete, all the craziness you could do in that. We've put all of that into infrastructure because we had this consistent GraphQL API that we could rely upon. And I think that was a, you know, years downstream effect that I certainly didn't anticipate when we were working on it that I think has proved really valuable. So we were talking about organizational challenges and evangelism and all that sort of stuff. Are there any disadvantages to the consumers of your APIs? Is it hard to convince people they want this? Uh, for us, I think uh, the choice of going down the relay path uh, provides a steep learning curve at first. Having to understand the concept of edges and nodes um, isn't the most... Um, intuitive thing, I think, in the world, as opposed to just having like the simple API that was brought up earlier. Um, I think just that learning curve is challenging, but again, graphical solves a ton of that for us. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the people have tried. Um, I, I haven't heard a single voice basically stating that this is shit, I don't want to use it. Not one. Um, all, of the, all of the people that, that have used it only asked, okay, when? When can I use that? Which is a good thing. I mean, it, it sound gives you at, at least the good feeling that you're on the right track somehow. In the end, if you build something for for people to use it, right? If they they use it, it shows. Um, um, on, if they love it, it shows that you're on the right track in that regard. Uh, we have a similar issue around education. Like we support a very broad spectrum of developers and backgrounds which is why like, we've had to be really conscious about releasing SDKs that can wrap things up in a restish sort of way, as well as keeping the API open so that people who are familiar with the technology can use it. So yeah, definitely just supporting everybody who's not going to learn GraphQL up to people who are really, really into it and want to learn every bit, bit of it. So you make SDKs for Rails developers to use, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, in case it's, you don't remember I'm a Rails developer, so when I'm making fun of them, it's me. You know, I'm not 
not making fun of Brooks here necessarily. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's interesting that you said uh, people aren't complaining, Bjorn. Whenever I release something, no matter how good it is, it seems like if I have users, they're yelling at me. Someone is, you know. Uh, at Wonderlist, the, the uh, support team talks about all caps Germans. Whenever we release a new, <laughs> new, new release of Wonderlist, there's always our very passionate local community that types to us in all caps. So. You also FQL. end up almost on the, the hedonic treadmill of development, which is taken from a note from Mark Slee, who was a developer at Facebook, uh, where after, you know, after five years at this point, like GraphQL for Facebook developers is not cool or shiny, it's kind of table stakes. And then the things like, oh wow, every field isn't, every field is non-nullable, like that's really annoying, I have to null check everything. Or the thing, you know, has previous page, has next page, what I talked about, like the things that, when it was new and shiny, it's like, eh, it's a minor issue, but like this is great, like we're happy with it, ends up being like, wait, no, this is just the way the world works. And so like the bar is constantly almost being raised, and I like that, because it's like it constantly forces us to drive forward. Uh, what do you think about uh, Taz's subscription suggestion? Oh yeah, that was cool. Um, I don't like. It's one of those I haven't. I haven't given it like enough thought to have like a really full formed opinion. But the problem that he mentioned is one that like we've definitely run into. Um, to be honest, we've mostly dodged it because for something like live likes, it's like oh no, you missed a like that happened in there. It's fine. Like it'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I think it is, it's the type of thing where if you are building messaging, you need to solve that problem in subscriptions. Uh, I'd love to see more discussion in that space. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> uh, for us, we're working on, uh, well, we're not actually working on it. There was a hackathon project once <laughs> uh, on converting our webhooks to use GraphQL. And I think for um, once we start to go down that road, this will certainly be a problem for us, but it's not really something that we've experienced yet. All right, next. Make that one go away. How could a good integration of GraphQ oh, I can't. GraphQL into TypeScript slash Flux look like, both for servers and for clients? Anyone able to understand what I just said, or should I repeat it? Sometimes I read things backwards. Opinions on TypeScript, GraphQL? I haven't used it personally. I've, I've only used Flow, so I have, I have no strong opinions on TypeScript. Brooks is a Rubyist, he says. <laughs> we have no opinions about this, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you look at like I'm most familiar on the client side in JavaScript at least with Relay Modern, uh, you know, Relay and, and Relay Modern really is almost like the flux diagram, like the canonical one, where it's just like, and then you write GraphQL on it and write GraphQL on every piece and take all of the simplifying assumptions. You know, one of the assumptions in flux is you have the dispatcher which talks to a bunch of stores because you could have many stores for storing different things. You have a comment store and a like store and a post store. And like, if you're using GraphQL, it's like, well, that's just a single GraphQL store and it simplifies things. And then certainly once you are, like, assuming you have a schema, you, like I showed in my talk, generating flow types, you could just as easily demonstrate, or like generate TypeScript types as well. So I think that, I, I look, you know, Relay Modern doesn't perfectly answer this question, but I think the concepts behind most of the modern JS clients, Relay Modern, Apollo Client, like, really do match Flux, and then generating TypeScript is very similar to how, at least Relay Modern generates flow. Well, I'm not a programmer at all, so I don't even know what those things mean. Um, how do you handle, oh, remember, you can still put your questions in, and if it's a great question, it might pop up at the top. Or if you just hit the button over and over, it actually counts every vote. So if you really, really want your question in, it's not too late. GraphQL-Europe.org slash QA. How do we implement rate limiting? For it as hard as you can. That's what he's saying. He said, bring it on, hands up. Uh, so, how do you handle the GraphQL versionless in your implementations? It's an unsolved problem for us right now. We haven't had to make, uh, actually we just did make a bunch of breaking changes because we wanted to get the schema the way we wanted it. Um, and this was kind of like the first round. If we wanted to, sorry, so I should back up by saying when we released our alpha, the understanding was that this may break at any time. And we wanted to take advantage of that alpha to make all the breaking changes that we possibly could have made so that everything looked perfect to us from the start. Um, 
now that we're avoiding breaking changes, I imagine this will be much harder. Uh, for us, it'll probably just be additive fields and deprecating old fields. Uh, I would imagine, and this is not set in stone, but I would imagine there'd be some sort of expectation with our users that once a field has been deprecated, um, it will not be gone. It won't be present in the schema six months from then, um, and that will allow us to rip it from the schema. But what's really cool about this is that you can, unlike a REST API, you can identify the exact fields that someone depends on, and you can see over time if something mar is marked as deprecated. Hopefully, you would see a drop off in the number of people relying on it. Uh, whether or not that's the case is another story, though. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly for us um, a very, very interesting property because we sort of have been doing that in the past, at least internally, to this explicit list, know who, who is calling you and what portions of data he, he needs from you. And actually tracking that over time makes you, allows you to do much, much smarter decisions in the regard. Because if only 0.5% of, of, of the devices, maybe even an old device uses that field, Maybe you just let it break. I mean, I mean, it's 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 those kind of trade-offs you can make if you have the data available, uh, rather than being in the dark about that. Yeah, we uh, track deprecation in Splunk, so all of our deprecated appeals show up in Splunk, and you can actually see what shops are using them and what API clients are using them. So if it's just down to like one app that hasn't adopted, we can even reach out to them and be like, "Hey guys, please stop using this," uh, whether that's a shop or like an app developer who's working with a bunch of different shops, so it's fairly easy that way, I hope. Our public API has only been out for a few weeks. These all sound way better than the tools we have. We bump a counter every time someone calls a deprecated field. If that deprecated field counter over the last week goes to zero, uh, we like kill it. Um, and then it, this is a process that happens about every six months when someone on the GraphQL team is like, we probably have a bunch of deprecated fields now. Let's go and see how many of them are. And a diff goes out that removes a bunch of them. So I think that is, that's the basis of something better. There's almost certainly improvements that can be made on that. And then we, we do the sort of same additive trick and we've sort of developed naming conventions over time that don't mortally offend us. I think the canonical example is if we deprecate a connection but the connection was really correctly named, you know, groups.members and it's like, yeah, that's the right name. What are we gonna name it? Uh, we'll deprecate that and create groups.allmembers. It's like, members already had all the members but like, you see all members and they're like, all right, that doesn't mortally offend me. I don't want to cringe every time I look at my API. Uh, if we ever have to deprecate that one, we'll be in trouble. Taking suggestions. I like that everyone talks, seems to talk about monitoring and metrics in this community. That's a, a lovely side effect. Uh, traditional API gateways have been primarily focused around REST with an asterisk. I guess that's restish. Uh, how do you envision or have seen GraphQL changing API gateways? Well, um, for, for us, it's actually pushing a lot of things we're, we're doing, I mean, right now manually, uh, like, like um, ensuring that, that we fetch efficiently data from the platform and the clients pushing down to, to the gateway. Um, we're also seeing that it sort of changes the way, um, as I already earlier said, that um, you know, it, it teaches our developers to a larger degree. Right, because it informs them already earlier, okay, what you're trying to do right now is maybe not the best thing to do. Try to fetch it in, in two requests, for instance. Um, also, what, what um, we figured out, at least in the last years, is like um, if you fetch from multiple data sources, this is uh, a thing that notoriously goes wrong um, because you... People often forget dealing with timeouts, batch things together, those kind of things. And you can take that to a certain degree out of the applications and push, push that to a lower level. Right? And our, um, what we do in our proxy is basically every, every sort of common thing that can uh, appear in multiple places like a job or like a profile whatsoever um, has to be batchable by default. So it needs to be, in, in, in terms of the internal API, be rephrasable in, to, to get them all in bulk from the internal APIs. And that um, is all work that previously was done manually by our developers and doesn't have to be done now um, anymore, which I think is a great property of this. Uh, I hear OData has a jingle. What are the plans to have a jingle for GraphQL? Uh, Lee's working on it as we speak. Right now? <laughs> and he is going to perform it during his keynote? Is that what you said? I, I don't want to reveal anything, but that's All what right. I heard. Excellent. 
Do you sacrifice graph design to keep the ability to request everything in a single request? Sorry, I saw this one on the screen. Uh, I think you get the ability to request everything in a single request if you don't sacrifice graph design. I, your your uh, talk had this section on like avoiding sort of inlining string fields when there was actually an object. And uh, Lee and I were actually joking because it was almost straight from a talk that I gave internally like with very similar ideas. And I think the common case where I'm like, oh no, you need to do multiple round trips is you return just like a random ID field where it's like, oh yeah, here's the group and you know, here's the, the cover photo ID. It's like, okay, great. Uh, I actually wanted to URL, so I'm now going to have to do another round trip. And I would argue that if that's the API, we sacrifice the graph design because there wasn't really a cover photo ID there. There was a cover photo object that we should have been linking to as an object, which would have had ID and also everything else that you wanted on it. So I, my feeling is these actually, like it, it's not really a trade off. You're actually, the more that you actually represent the underlying graph, the more likely it is that someone will be able to do it only in one round trip. Uh, the only thing I have to add is with regards to pagination, which I don't think is a GraphQL problem, but just how we paginate at GitHub. Um, you do have to make more round trips the further down in the graph that you get in order to paginate successfully over something that's deeply nested. Um, in that case, it can be a little bit more challenging. That is a trade-off with REST, because theoretically you could just fetch that in a lower, lower how, number. How so? Can you go into more detail there? Sure. So like if you're saying for the repositories and then the issues of each of those repositories and for each of those issues, uh, all of the authors or something. If you want to paginate deeply over everything, um, I feel I could be wrong here, but I feel like the math would add up and that you have to make more queries to the server than if you had to fetch each of them independently. I could be wrong there, though. I have no idea. That's actually that's a case I haven't thought too much about, so that's interesting. I'm, I'm not really sure if this answers this, but like that's part of what the client that we built does is that it actually looks up the query graph to the nearest node and just percolates it up to the top, and then you request there. That's perfect, yeah. So if you can avoid the deeply nested connections and do it at the top level, that's a perfect solution for that. OK, so what GraphQL tool are you missing that someone from the community could build? I used to have a good answer because it was tabs and graphical, but then someone from the community built it. So. <laughs> Sorry, not tabs, history. Tabs and graphical. I feel like that's also out there. Um, optics is something that we're really looking for. We use Splunk as well in order to identify when a field has been deprecated, who's using what sort of things. Um, I feel like uh, really just uh, the Apollo optics story is, is a great one. I'm really excited to see where that turns out for server-side development. I feel like the tool space, when I think about it, is one where I almost like, we're not going to know it until somebody builds it, and then we're going to look at it and go like, oh yeah, like how did we ever live without that? that? That's certainly how I feel about graphical, where that was not something I don't think that was like top of mind, where it's like, oh yeah, we've got to have graphical, and then it was built in, it's like, how did we ever live without this tool? Like, it's just become ubiquitous. And so I almost, like, I think there are a lot of interesting tool ideas that will come to mind, but. I suspect that the next tool that comes out that just like blows everyone away, the reason it's gonna blow everyone away is because nobody nobody was like, oh, we needed this, it's filling a void. It like found a void that we didn't even know existed. You could probably say the same thing about GraphQL itself. That people didn't know they needed it, then there it is, and that's why it's gone so quickly in a year. All right, any advice on testing a GraphQL API, writing acceptance tests for all your queries, unit testing resolver logic, et cetera? Um, our solution is pretty much just integration tests for everything, which is uh, throw money at CI, essentially, is our solution to it. Uh, we do have, we're starting to get closer. As we reuse resolvers between connections and between fields, we're starting to, to like, unit test those, but uh, we don't have a great story for that. We're basically doing the same and planning to do expand on that. Um, I, I'm a little bit dubious about the value of testing, I mean, part of the schema. Right? I mean, in the end, you want to see how it's going to resolve and whether it resolves to your expectation. Um, I definitely see more value in the um, integration test there also for developers. Like, I mean, if I, we try to keep the, the amount that people need to contribute to basically the graph as low as possible. I mean, it's a low barrier thing, and if we thought it might not be a good idea, you know, you have to 
supply tests for all, all of that things. I mean, we have the type system there. I mean, probably a lot of the integration can already be done to a certain degree um, based on metadata that automatically is there once you modify the graph. And um, just again, following the theme of making life for the client people easier. Yeah, don't, I, I mean, at least at Facebook, like, I don't think there's a primitive for unit testing resolvers. Uh, I consider that a feature rather than a bug in that if your resolver is so, is so interesting that you want to write a unit test for it, like, we, I put thin API layer up, that's definitionally not thin. Like, you should have pushed that down into the layer below it because you're doing something interesting there. Um, I think integration tests where it's like make sure that you know end to end the like hello world query still works is good. Uh, we have integration tests that make sure that our schema is sane um, because I actually don't know if you can make insane schemas in the open source, but like there used to be weird, interesting things that could go wrong in the schema if like you had conflicting fields. Um, but yeah, un unit testing resolvers. If you want to have a thick GraphQL layer, then you probably need it. Uh, we aspire to have a thin one, and so we aspire not to have it. Cool. Okay, so last question for us, maybe, if I decide, because uh, that's the only job of the moderator. If it's boring, then I'm gonna ask another one. Rule by no pressure. How would you implement widget level error handling for queries? Uh, I mean, I think the error handling story is always interesting because, like, in a very traditional REST, it's like, did you load the resource? Yes, no, like 500 or 200. Uh, with GraphQL, it's like, I loaded 87 resources in here and two failed. Do you want me to fail the whole query or do you want me to t give you the 85 that were available and somehow indicate that the two are wrong? Uh, this sort of comes back to the fact that errors is like very much not a solved problem. Um, the best solutions I've seen so far are return null in the query itself, but then in the errors, you would return two errors, each of which had like a JSON path pointing to the thing that was null and would sort of be like, hey, like the reason this is null is because there was an error. And I can imagine, again, assuming without loss of generality, we have a good error story, like that gives you the ability when you go to this widget, you see it's null, somehow you look up in the errors and be like, aha, this is the error I need to show, show a little red box and be like, this particular widget failed because X. Um, that assumed like three things that don't exist today, but the concepts seem to be all there. What it's didn't we talk about that you wished, which wished we would have talked about on this panel, somebody? You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're actually migrating Facebook to OData as we speak. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sort of surprised there weren't more questions about subscriptions in live. Uh, I don't actually, like, I think it's an interesting topic. I don't, there's no, like, thing I wanted to say about it, but I expected there to be more questions about that. I'm a tiny bit surprised nobody's asked, like, why GraphQL over something like JSON Schema or JSON API, because those solve a lot of similar problems. I'm not going to say they do it better, because I think GraphQL does it better, <laughs> but I'm curious. Yeah, Just boy. already had buy-in from the audience if you're at this conference. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I would like to thank you all. And uh, as a parting gift, I'd like to offer you each either a still or sparkling water. And, but, a, uh, and a chair. Yeah, you may take it with you. Sounds Please good. do not leave the building with it, though. Uh, if you do, you have to bring it back tonight. That's the deal. But uh, uh, from the audience, thank you very much. And... Uh,